Okay, we are recording now. So, uh, namaskar for those in India. Uh, good evening. Uh, boa, bom dia para o pessoal que está aqui no Brasil. Uh, aqui estamos começando mais um Café Consciência. Hoje com o nosso uh, caríssimo professor Sandeep Tripathi da Índia, e da Universidade de GLA, de Matura, Índia. E ele vai falar hoje sobre é, independência e é, processo de descolonização, decolonização na Índia. É, eu sou good morning for those in Brazil. Um, namaskar for my friends in India. Um, we are today in Café Consciência from Universidade de Pinhais. Uh, in cooperation today with uh, GLA University, Matura, India, uh, we have our very distinguished guest, Dr. Sandeep Tripathi, who is uh, going to speak with us about independence and decolonization. I, would, I am really appreciating that we have many people, not only from Faculdade de Pinhais, Brazil, but we also have our distinguished professors from the university, and we also have uh, professors from Sao Paulo. I have just seen that Professor Emilio Mendonça from Gebrix USP has also joined us, so um, in, I will speak in English because they, they understand that. Uh, thank you very much, my friends from Gebrix, because uh, you make this event very, very special. For our dear students from uh, FAP, Universidade, uh, Faculdade de Pinhais, and I also thank everyone that is coming from India to watch this event. This makes our cooperation much, uh, much more beautiful, I would say, because we are showing that we have two different countries who can cooperate and two countries who have a very deep uh, uh, future ahead of them. So with that, I thank you very much, Professor Sandeep Tripathi, and I will give you the floor. Thank you very much. Namaskar and um, Danyavad. Danyavad for being here. Thank you very thank much. You. Muito obrigado. Professor, thank you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Institute of Legal Studies and Research, Ayala Shah Jia University. I would like to thank uh, Professor Cassio Zin, uh, Professor of International Law, uh, Faculty of Finhash, Brazil, that uh, you provided me uh, such an opportunity uh, to deliver a lecture on this important topic that is uh, very, very close to India and, of course, uh, to Brazil also. I would like to thank uh, <coughs> uh, faculty uh, dean, faculty of law, Professor uh, Dr. Moriel Muraro uh, uh, for uh, organizing this uh, beautiful uh, program. Uh, that is a uh, very amazing uh, the way uh, you organized. And uh, as well as I would like, I would like, I would like to also thank my colleague, Professor Jones Nantala, uh, the last one month before. Uh, we have shared a uh, no, uh, perform of international conference. Uh, he's a very uh, good friend of mine. And thank you, Professor Nantala. And I would like, so, uh, I would like to also thank uh, Nadia French and other uh, faculty members, uh, professors of international law at Brazil, uh, uh, faculty of Pinhas, as well as the Sao Paulo University. Uh, <clears throat> When I was requested by my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Cassio Zim, to deliver a lecture on this topic, uh, so really it was a very uh, proud and honored moment for me. And I soon accepted this invitation. Uh, and uh, really, uh, I, uh, I, I would like to thank from my university as well as from my school, law school, that uh, today uh, we are uh, uh, going to discuss about uh, such a topic uh, that is uh, most important, uh, that is very close to the people of India and the people of Brazil. And uh, most importantly, uh, I would like to touch uh, the decolonization process uh, 
India and Brazil both at the last point. So it will show how a both country experience the decolonization experience. So that is, that would be important uh, uh, part of this lecture. Now uh, I would like to uh, focus my uh, some <coughs> some of the uh, lecture segments. So dear uh, Professor Casio, can you uh, move the slide first? Next. I, I will stop you a little bit, Professor, so that I can translate. Professor Sandip agradeceu a organização, agradeceu a professora Maria Muraro, aos integrantes lá da Universidade de São Paulo, da Universidade, a Faculdade de Pinhais, e ele disse que ele vai tentar fazer um estudo sobre o processo de descolonização é, índia e também tocando um pouco com os assuntos do Brasil, ele gosta muito do assunto. Um, so, professor, please continue. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, today uh, I'll summarize my lecture on these four segments. Uh, first, uh, I would like to focus on the concept of uh, colonization, the notion of colonization, as well as uh, the decolonization process. Uh, we will try to understand on this particular topic. And the second segment, I will focus on India's decolonization process and independence movement, uh, which we know as a freedom movement. Now, the third point that is the most important, uh, uh, the colonial development. I'll, today, I'll you know, uh, try to make argument that, yes, the colonial, uh, so-called development is a myth. It's not reality. I'll focus on my lecture today uh, with the theory, uh, with the help of theory, A.G. Frank theory of dependency. A.G. Frank is an uh, economic historian, so I'll you know, employ this, uh, his theory and this uh, narratives so that yes uh, colonial, colonialism uh, it cannot be no it cannot be uh, it cannot be as a development for the colonized country uh, so i i i put the debate between the whether it uh, whether it has delighted the colonized or whether it has destroyed the colonized the last point uh, which is the most important for today's lecture indian brazil a comparative analysis of decolonization process uh, uh, in which I'll, I would like to focus that how both, how the, the both country which is situated uh, in the southern hemisphere in the globe both how both are experienced with the with the colonial experience uh, same kind of experience same kind of pain same kind of subjugation yes it might different the path of the might different for the decolonization process but yes the kind of pain the kind of subjugation the kind of humiliation the country face that is most important to understand today's lecture so this is the first uh, fourth segment uh, which i would like to cover my lecture i would like to revolve my theme on this fourth segment so thank you so okay. much. Okay, um, I will I will translate now in Portuguese, Professor. I'm sorry if I, I will I will have to to do that for a uh, uh, common understanding of everyone. Então, pessoal, o professor Sandip ele dividiu a leitura dele em quatro tópicos. Primeiro, ele vai falar sobre noções de colonização e decolonização dos processos de colonização e decolonização. Ele também vai trabalhar. É, o processo na Índia, como é que foi o de decolonização e o, o movimento de independência. E depois ele vai falar, é, e ele considera esse um dos pontos mais importantes da leitura dele, o, o mito do desenvolvimento colonial, e aí ele faz uma análise com base num historiador da economia, que é o E.G. Frank, e o E.G. Frank ele vai mostrar como o... O mito do desenvolvimento, o desenvolvimento foi para quem, como assim que isso aconteceu. E por último, ele vai trabalhar uma análise comparativa do processo de descolonização de Brasil, porque foram países que sofreram é, processo de colonização e, e precisaram passar por processo de independência. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, can you move this slide? Okay, thank you. So let's start uh, understanding the notion of colonization and decolonization process. As I said, that uh, uh, colonization is something beyond the 
political and economic annexation of a country. It is something beyond the uh, see. It is something beyond the uh, political control. It is something beyond the uh, like uh, trading purpose. Uh, though we uh, we understand, uh, we know that historically all the colonizers uh, came as a trading uh, a trading pattern, uh, a trading you know line of uh, argument. But uh, somehow, you know, uh, gradually they have tried to uh, absorb themselves in the shim colonies. So it is somehow beyond the uh, beyond the um, uh, you know, uh, economic and political structure. It is a, a kind of mindset of. It is a kind of the dominance that is established by the colonizer on the colony. It is somehow the attitude. It is somehow the latitude, altitude, the angle. It is somehow the you know, pattern of thinking, and that is why, after the after the independence, uh, what we call that we are independent country. There is a discourse that yes, there is a colonized mindset of. There is a discourse, yes, 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 there is a colonial legacy. What the legacy? Legacy is a mindset of, because they left the country, but still there is a tradition of uh, experience, colonial experience. So somehow it is beyond political and economic structure, economic dominance. It establishes, I, I guess it establishes you know, economic, political, social, psychological, cultural, and the, all the manifestation that controls that controls the colonized people. So this is some way... Hey, sorry, colonies. sorry, professor. I will have to stop you sometimes to, to do the translation. Então, o professor, uh, <laughs> professor Sandip está explicando que o colonialismo é um estado de mente que vai além de questões da mera anexação econômica ou política, né? Ele, ele destaca como o colonizador, muitas vezes, ele surgiu como um parceiro de negócios, então ele buscava fazer o comércio, o comércio, isso foi muito além. Isso produz um estado mental, um, um estado da psique no colonizado, fazendo com que estes se vejam como inferiores e o colonizador como superiores em todos os assuntos de civilização. Então, político, cultural, isso daí estabelece uma dominação entre o poderoso e o fraco. É, e isso daí é uma questão de atitude, de latitude, de altitude e de ângulo, é, é muda toda a visão, muda toda a perspectiva das pessoas. Tchau, so, thank you. So let me proceed. Let me proceed. Yes, hello. people, hello. Yes, yes, let me proceed. Please. Hello. Hello, professor. Okay, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so as I said, that it is, uh, it is a uh, mindset. It is a psychological pattern uh, through the different operators. Let me quote uh, Churchill's racial superiority uh, based statement for Indians. Winston uh, Churchill is the former prime minister uh, during the uh, Second World War, and. Uh, you know, he made some you know, notorious statement for the Indians that reflects his you know, racial superiority. And I said, this is complex. This is not something to control over the colony. It is something that controls the mindset of... And let me quote Winston Churchill. I hate Indians... Eu acho que o professor Sandy pode ter tido um problema de é, conexão agora. Ele disse que podiam ter hoje alguns problemas de é, conexão com ele lá na Índia por causa de uma tempestade. I believe that Professor Sandeep uh, is uh, offline. He had a little bit of problem. And he will reconnect soon. He, he told us that maybe he would have some uh, power shortages issues today. Um, but uh, as soon as he gets back, we will... Uh, okay, Professor, we are back. I think you had a small uh, uh, connection issue. Okay. So okay. please, uh, please... Okay. Sorry for the disturbance. It uh, did happen. In, in <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> yes, I was, uh, uh, I was explaining uh, the church's statement uh, 
uh, that uh, he said, I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with the beastly religion. Are you getting me? My voice is clear. Hello. Yes, it's clear. Okay. It's perfect. Okay. 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 So uh, let the viceroy sit on the back of a giant elephant and tremble Gandhi into the dirt. So see how we can see how he made a such kind of remarks on the Indian or uh, the people and the Indian leadership. Uh, so and let me let me you know, uh, conclude this uh, remarks by this uh, uh, argument that as I said, uh, the colonizer uh, always use uh, some apparatus to establish the psychological superiority. The, you, know, you can say the uh, complex uh, superiority is some uh, different apparatus. Just like uh, when the Britishers came in India and they started the education policy. So this it was not it was not the mission of education policy. Somehow it was the uh, they said that yes it was a civilization mission. Civilization means when they claim the civilization means that means Asians, Indians are backward, the Indians are so illiterate, Indians are so noble, savage. Uh, so this is kind of mentality that they have. So they don't say that we are we are providing education. They are saying that we are going to civilize the Asian country. So this kind of superiority, uh, this kind of in terms of the social, in terms of the cultural, in terms of the education, in terms of the political. So they try to they try to infiltrate. They try to penetrate the Indian psychology. So let me see. Uh, this see the notion of. Yeah, yes, let me continue. I, 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 will, I will stop sometimes to translate. Uh, okay. Então, o professor Sandeep Tripathi estava falando de uma frase do Winston Churchill para mostrar o quanto que é essa visão de superioridade que o colonizador muitas vezes cria para cima do colonizado. Então, ele fala, o Churchill, que ele odeia os indianos. Ele acredita que são um povo selvagem, com uma religião selvagem. E ele afirma, deixa o vice-rei sentar-se nas costas de um elefante gigante e atropelar Andy, é, Gandhi no, uh, na sujeira. Ele diz que, por exemplo, na questão da educação, nunca foi visto pelo colonizador britânico um método de vamos educar as pessoas, vamos pensar em uma, uma educação real, mas sempre foi visto como aquela visão de colonizar, como se o outro fosse o selvagem e que precisasse ser é trazido para a civilização como se o, 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 o superior europeizado fosse é, é, mostrar uma cultura superior, mostrar a civilização e trazer a civilização para a Índia. Ok. Thank you, professor. Ok. So, uh, on this background, on this context, uh, I think 1948, when the uh, Union, Union declares it as all kinds of uh, no, uh, colonizers, all kind of uh, colonism. Uh, you can say that all the manifestations of the colonism is the kind of evil. Got it? It cannot be justified. And that is why uh, after the Second World War, I mean, there been some European country that declared that imperialist power, but they don't they, they don't recall themselves as a you know, colonist because colonist is all about you know exploiter. They, they are they're just referred as exploiter. So that is why UN declares the, in all its manifestation, colonism is evil, and uh, every person has a right to self determination. So the, the, the slogan of the self-determination, the slogan of, you know, uh, it, it becomes vital for, his, uh, for the decolonization process. Uh, so this is all about the concept of uh, uh, colonism uh, that, uh, yes, uh, directly it controls a country uh, through uh, its various uh, apparatus like uh, education system, like cultural system, like political power, like leadership qualities. Uh, and, and, and it appears like this is you know, oriented for the economic you know, benefits. But however, however, it is deeply rooted in the psychology. So this is all about the colonialism. Um, então, o professor explica que é, não há uma justificativa, não existe fundamento para você poder justificar o colonialismo especialmente depois da Segunda Guerra Mundial. Então, por isso que 
é, muitos países começaram a se tornar independentes, buscar a independência, o processo de colonização, e eles, é, nas declarações da ONU, afirmando que todos os, uh, que isso daí seria maligno, seria errado, e isso daí é uma forma de dominação, inclusive econômica, que ela pode surgir por diferentes, é, diferentes é, mecanismos, né? Então, mecanismos educacionais, econômicos, uh, mecanismos de dominação política, controle de liderança... E, e aí, por isso daí que surgiram um, dúvidas. Uh, professor Sandeep, uh, one uh, student of yours, I believe, she asked to make uh, questions. Um, about questions, everyone uh, would like, if you could write, pessoal que tem perguntas, please write questions in the chat. Uh, it can be in Portuguese and it can be in English. Pessoal, se vocês têm perguntas, por favor, escrevam no chat para a gente poder é, depois fazer as perguntas, porque senão a gente vai ficar complicado sem conseguir é, traduzir e falar ao mesmo tempo. So, I ask everyone that has questions if you can write it on the chat, right there on the right. You can write, and then we, after the, the lecture, we can ask Professor Tripathi. So, uh, sorry to interrupt you again, Professor. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so let us see uh, uh, the process of colonization. Uh, how, uh, wha how did it start? Uh, let us uh, decoding uh, the colonization process. Uh, by the 16th century, as we know that Brazil and India has experienced, that the 16th century, uh, early the 16th century, both country and uh, I started to, uh, under the influence of the Portuguese. So initially, Spain and Portuguese they started the colonization process, and it was the Portuguese uh, that you know, Vasco da Gama came in India first time, and uh, he discovered the sea route uh, for the trade. As well, it was the Portuguese uh, you know, who, uh, who discovered Brazil. That's a very uh, no, interesting, fascinating point that the, for, the, for the first time, it Portuguese who discovered Brazil. So someone went for the Brazil and someone came from the India. Uh, someone <laughs> went for the uh, uh, you know, uh, USA. So the colonies, the discovery of the colonies for what? The discovery of the colonies for the economic issue during that time because the industrialization process you know, uh, had started in Europe. So they were trying. They were trying to you know. Uh, they were trying to some raw materials. They were trying to some workforce. So for that, someone went to Brazil, and the Brazil were discovered by the Portuguese. And some you know, Vasco da Gama came in India. So initially, it was started by the Spain and Portugal. After that, after that, France and uh, you can say the French and the British. Uh, they also started uh, this colonization process, and most importantly, it became a sense of pride. It became a sense of pride. This is matter. This is a very important point because there is competition between Spain, Portugal, France, and the British. Whom, which country has which which number of colonies? So that that become a competitive com, uh, competitive between the colonies. And that was there was competition in India first of uh, you know Portuguese then Dutch then of, uh, English and then uh, France. So uh, it, you are very so fortunate in Brazil that only Portuguese came and the, finally they remain for the, for the long time. But in this experience for like the four you know uh, European country like first Portuguese the Dutch and you know uh, the British finally and the French. So this is what the process of colonization is start from the Europe uh, in the context of industrial revolution to meet the requirement of the industrial revolution first workforce and then raw materials. Yes. Okay. Um, I will translate. Então, o professor Sandip explicou que o processo de colonização que foi iniciado lá no começo por Espanha e Portugal <coughs> teve muitas similaridades entre o Brasil e a Índia no começo, especialmente porque as pessoas vieram para cá, tentaram dominação militar, depois Vasco da Gama foi até a Índia, então eles tiveram na Índia a experiência de terem uma fase de colonização por Portugal e depois, aí ele falou que aí vem uma diferença, né, enquanto o Brasil, ele teve, aspas, a sorte de ter tido apenas uma potência colonial para cima deles durante a colonização, a Índia não, a Índia teve que passar primeiro pelos portugueses, depois pelos, 
uh, depois pelos holandeses, depois pelos britânicos, e que isso daí ele destaca que se tornou praticamente uma, uma questão de orgulho entre as potências europeias para dizer quem que tinha mais colônias, quem que tinha a colônia mais importante, mais relevante do ponto de vista econômico. E que isso daí aconteceu também, a gente tem que lembrar, no contexto da Revolução Industrial. Então, um primeiro passo, as colônias elas eram tidas como fonte de matéria-prima, né? então força de trabalho, aliás, força de trabalho, né? pessoas, e depois isso daí foi visto como uma fonte de... É de matéria-prima pura, crua, para a industrialização na Europa. Ah, e, professor, can you move the slide? Yes. Hello. Am I clear to you? Hello. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, okay. it's perfect. Okay. okay. So now, this is all about the colonization. And uh, now I'll, and I'll focus on the decolonization because this term is important for today's lecture. Uh, because the decolonization comes later, first the colonization and the, and the second process, then the decolonization. Uh, as my dear friends, that, uh, the term itself denotes the decolonization, a process to acquire independence from the uh, uh, colonizers, uh, a colony that will try to uh, get independence Uh, independence of what? First of all, independence, let me play political independence, because the political independence, the other independence will start soon, like economic independence, cultural, social, other, other, other kind of independence. Aproveitar que o professor teve uma queda de eletricidade, ele estava falando o que é descolonização. Decolonização é um processo através do qual um país é, busca adquirir independência. Em primeiro lugar, a independência política. Né? É, acredito que a gente vai ter algumas interrupções. Assim. Um, Alan colocou alguma pergunta. Eu peço, Alan, que é, pode deixar que eu traduzo para o inglês. O Indy, é, a gente tem que ter bem certeza do que a gente vai perguntar, se a gente vai perguntar Indy para ele. Mas eu acredito que a gente consegue, como funciona, está fazendo exatamente a mesma pergunta, como funciona a ligação econômica entre Índia e os demais países no período pré-independência? Isso, professor. Tá. Eu só, eu só eu tô... uhum, Tá. Samia, eu vou traduzindo conforme o professor for falando, né? Uh, mas eu posso traduzir aqui o PowerPoint que ele colocou, o uh, processo de decolonização se refere ao processo através do qual um processo, um país colonizado adquire independência, é, transferência de poder de entidades imperiais para poderes indígenas, para é, povos indígenas, ou seja, soberania completa. O processo de decolonização é a consequência de movimentos de independência em territórios colonizados. Ele toma, ele, ele ocorre em... É, em sequência de resistência e revolta contra o poder colonial pelos povos indígenas. Falando de modo histórico, o processo de descolonização ocorre em três principais fases. Uh, so, welcome back, professor, and uh, please uh, feel free to continue. Thank you very much. Uh, ex extremely sorry for the disturbance, uh, the network, uh, sometimes connectivity issues, sometimes power break. So, I'm extremely sorry for that. It is absolutely not a problem, uh, Professor Sandeep. We are very glad that you are here and everything is flowing just well. And I will uh, try to translate in each sentence or two. If you could uh, make a little bit of pause between every two sentences or three sentences so that I can translate. And then we'll have later, I think, Professor would like to have the questions after the lecture, right? Sure, sure, sure. I'll, I'll keep okay, it. Uh, so, okay. So, as I said, the decolonization refers to the process through which a colonized country acquire uh, independence. Uh, that independence, uh, in terms of the political independence, and uh, if the colonized uh, country uh, acquire political independence, then other kind of independence, like social, Uh, like cultural, like economic, it will you know, it will be established uh, automatically 
got it so decolonization this though it is a long standing process for example india got independent 1947 however this decolonization process is still is still going on so this is not this is this is there is there's difference in the decolonization and the independence got it o professor estava explicando que é, então um primeiro momento, um primeiro passo é quando ocorre é, o processo de independência política e aí em seguida você tem outros processos de independência, por exemplo, cultural e, e econômica e a Índia, ele está dando o exemplo que a Índia se tornou politicamente independente em 1947, mas o processo de decolonização da Índia é um processo que ainda está em andamento porque ele ocorre normalmente depois da independência política e envolve outros processos. Okay. So, uh, uh, just this is about the decolonization process. Uh, the term itself denotes that it is not overnight, or no, it is not something, any declaration. Decolonization is not something, declaration of independence. Yes, this is long-standing process. A country may be uh, independent from the, uh, uh, from the colonizers. However, that this uh, the process of decolonization will continue after the independence one uh, so this is uh, that is why that is why the you know, latin american countries like uh, uh, african countries the asian countries uh, there is a long standing journey for the decolonization right uh, and uh, the people are demanding for the, uh, the self culture the people are demanding indigenous uh, no, indigenous local languages Uh, in indigenous local custom traditions that has been undermined by the uh, colonizers so uh, so this is a process that that will take uh, the time it it might be go for the century it might be go for the uh, century up to the century because as i said during my uh, definition interpretation of colonialism that the colonialism is the mind setup and the mind setup is not a issue of the uh, no 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 uh, you can say uh, disappear over the night it cannot be del uh, deleted uh, through the act of independence you know it is it is a evolving process so a decolonization oh. is a process okay uh, professor sandeep estava explicando que esse processo não ocorre de uma hora para outra porque ele envolve uh, o estabelecimento de um mindset então ele diz que depois da independência os países eles podem buscar o processo de decolonização por exemplo buscando tradições locais cultura local língua local comunicação local é, é Uh, povos locais para justamente uh, tentar se livrar desta desse estado mental que foi colocado pelo colonizador e isso daí pode demorar um século, pode demorar dois séculos, pode demorar mais tempo, menos tempo, mas é um processo que busca a recuperação de alguma coisa local. E como a gente viu, o processo de colonização ele é um processo que envolve muito muitas uh, modalidades de dominação, então isso daí pode levar tempo para se uh, encerrar. Ok. So let me focus now uh, the phases, the history of decolonization. Uh, the decolonization took place in the three major phases. The first phase was the late 18th century and the early 19th century is starting with the creation of the United States and ending with the freedom of spanish and portuguese colonies in the american continent so this was the first decolonization process this was the first american declaration of independence and independence 1776 so this is no it has you no know, created a sense of consciousness it had created a consciousness of self determination that has exposed the other colonies uh, so The second phase. Let me uh, point out the second phase. The second phase, uh, after the sec uh, First World War, made possible by the collapse of the Russian Empire uh, and the Ottoman Empire, and the most importantly, the, the third phase, which a very very important for all of us to understand, the decolonization process in the third phase that took after the Second World War, nineteen forty five. Post 1945, there was 
there was a change in the geopolitical map in the world a new countries were emerged like asian countries african country latin american countries they were emerged as from the colonies they, they, they were getting independence so the decolonization process sharply emerged as a very categorically emerged after the second world war due to the various reason due to the various reason that the decline of the political sorry economic and military power of the european countries so this is the three uh, historical phases of decolonization um o professor sandeep estava explicando as três fases da decolonização a primeira fase ele aponta como o final do século 18 início do século 19 especialmente a partir da independência dos Estados Unidos em 1776 e depois com a liberdade das colônias portuguesas e espanholas aqui no continente na América Latina. Ele aponta que nesse momento o foco era em adquirir a autodeterminação. E aí depois, a segunda onda que ocorreu é, no final da Primeira Guerra Mundial, ela foi possível especialmente depois do colapso de impérios como, por exemplo, o russo e o otomano, e aí a terceira fase que ele considera mais importante para o nosso estudo de hoje, a maior, ela aconteceu logo depois da, do fim da Segunda Guerra Mundial e o surgimento do dito terceiro mundo no mapa político internacional. Então a gente viu países da África, países da África, a Ásia, da América Latina, ganhando é, importância no cenário mundial e conquistando um espaço como países independentes. E isso daí foi uma mudança geopolítica significativa que aconteceu em boa parte pela perda de poder, inclusive poder econômico, dos países europeus na época do pós segunda Guerra Mundial. Thank you, professor. Yeah, move this slide. Yeah. yeah. This is a picture. Uh, Indian Independence Day, uh, 1947, 15 August. Uh, this is a new media coverage. 15th August and 1947. So, uh, can you uh, move the slide next? I, I'll uh, just oh. explain. Uh, that, aquilo ali, pessoal, era o jornal, o jornal da, do dia da independência da Índia, no dia 15 de agosto de 1947. A gente vê ali que está dizendo uh, Índia independente, o domínio britânico foi encerrado. E a Assembleia Constituinte acaba de é, assumir o poder. E aí, essa daqui foi a matéria que aconteceu no Hindustan Times, né, o jornal indiano. Uh, thank you, professor. Ok, uh, now I'll uh, be discussing about uh, uh, Indian uh, freedom movement, uh, uh, somewhat, uh, uh, some uh, decolonization process. Uh, I'll you know, summarize this uh, this point into the two uh, domains, first the political and uh, second the economic domain. Uh, how the economic factor has uh, you know, facilitated a sense of you know, uh, discontent, a sense of dissatisfaction among the Indian masses. And because of that, it created a sense of nationalism against the Britishers. Show of this first and the second, I'll focus on the political scenario that the Indian freedom movement uh, it was uh, it was a rainbow of uh, a rainbow of different uh, strategy in the tactics. One side moder um, moderatist and the second side uh, extremist. So this is the two uh, the two apparatus, the one economic factor and the political factor. And in the political factor under the Gandhian leadership. Finally, India got independence. So I'll focus on this. É o professor falando que ele vai olhar dois aspectos principais: o aspecto econômico, mas também o aspecto político. Ele vai mostrar que existiam duas grandes correntes de independentistas lá na Índia: uma corrente mais extremista, uma corrente mais moderada. Até o momento em que o, o Gandhi é, consegue é, atingir o processo de as well as uh, uh, state of Bengal. So uh, the war is known as the Battle of Plassey. This uh, war uh, become a milestone because in this war, East India Company, you can say the Britishers uh, got you know decisive victory over the uh, Bengal. And it is somewhat referred as the establishment of the British uh, East India Company rule. 
uh, from the middle of the 18th century and it lasted 100 years till the 1857 you can say the middle of 19th century so 100 years the administration of the company east india company uh, of the british um, o professor está explicando que no início é, o primeiro passo da colonização britânica na índia foi com a conquista de Bengal, na Batalha de Plessy, em 1757, quando assumiu ah, o governo, que foi, na verdade, o governo da ah, Companhia da Índia do Oriente, né? East India Company. É, e isso daí, esse governo que era feito por uma empresa, mas era britânico, né? É, ele atingiu o meio e foi para o colapso até a revolta de 1857. Então, aí um século de dominação por uma empresa, East India Company. So, uh, as I said, that uh, 100 years. later 1857 uh, 1857 is a landmark year for the indian uh, freedom struggle history uh, that uh, in this year there was the first independence war took place between the uh, indian soldiers and the britishers uh, army and uh, and uh, I, and you can understand uh, professor jen that uh, the kind of discontent, the kind of, you know, desperation emerged from uh, in the Indian masses uh, against the Britishers. So within the hundred years, uh, you no, know, they started, you know, they started voice against the Britishers. And uh, due to this uh, revolt, 1857, uh, some historians say it is revolt, some say it, is, it was a first independence movement, there is a, a dispute, but however, it was the first landmark uh, no, voice against the Britishers. So British, no, British government, British authority has shaken, and uh, the foundation of British authority has been shaken from this revolt. And after that, 1858, the British Crown established officially its authority in the Indian subcontinent. That is known as the British Raj, so which, which lasted 200 years uh, until the 1947. Sure. No. Okay, uh, sorry, to, I, I have to interrupt sometimes, professor, to translate. Uh, então, o professor estava explicando que é, o que aconteceu em 1857 ainda é objeto de disputa entre historiadores. Alguns dizem que foi uma revolta, outros dizem que foi o início do movimento de independência da Índia, mas era um momento de saturação, um momento no qual os, é, a população local da Índia não suportava mais o governo da uh, Companhia das Índias Orientais, e por conta disso daí, eles é, começaram a agir contra o governo, e aí o resultado foi que a coroa britânica passou a atuar no, no período que eles chamaram de Rule of Crown, né, que era o, o momento no qual os britânicos assumiram o controle da Índia Agora não como uma empresa, mas como a própria coroa britânica, uh, como se fosse um território britânico puramente dito. Mas isso daí foi um momento fundamental para, é, em 1958, 1858, que os britânicos assumiram como um governo próprio deles, é, foi o um momento no qual a consciência nacional da Índia começou a surgir, na, nas, nas massas indianas e que isso daí facilitou o surgimento do movimento nacionalista na Índia. Ok, thank you, for sure. Uh, okay, sure. So, uh, <coughs> I just said that uh, 
uh, and once 1858 uh, the british raj established in india a directory directly and uh, they started you no know, they started subjugation they started uh, uh, the different kind of tactics to control the indian continent uh, some were education through education policies some were the, uh, the different kind of mechanism they adopted uh, because of that uh, subjugation and atrocities, uh, you know, uh, Indian National Congress, uh, uh, after 19, uh, 1858, there was a landmark year is uh, in uh, the establishment of Indian National Congress, 1885. So this, uh, this became as a platform, the voice against the Britishers. Okay. So Indian National Congress become a, a, a launching pad, a become a pad that a raised a voice, a register against the Britishers. Yes, it might be moderate or it might be extreme. There, there were the two different version in Indian struggle against the Britishers. There are some moderates and there are some extremists. The moderates they were trying to convince. Uh, Britishers through a uh, uh, soft power and the extremists they were trying to uh, throw the Britishers uh, through extremist met methodology. So, então ele 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 explica que nessa época surgiu o Congresso Nacional Indiano National Indian Congress e que é, buscava o processo de independência. Porém, haviam duas correntes: a corrente moderada e a corrente extremista. Enquanto a corrente moderada ela buscava convencer os britânicos a assumirem é, um, um governo mais de consenso, ou ainda através de soft power, né, os lados mais extremistas buscavam isso através de métodos mais é, violentos. Ok, thank okay. you, professor. Ok, ok. So, uh, in continuation, uh, this is line of argument, as I said that there was two extremes, the moderate and the extremist. And the objective was the same, uh, freedom and uh, self-determination. Objective was, the path was different. As I said that uh, uh, Indian, uh, you know, uh, Indian national movement, uh, you can say Indian fight against the Britishers, it was somehow different from the Asian and African countries' experience. Because some Asian countries and African countries, they were they were trying to resort uh, some no, a guerrilla war, yeah, some so extremist line, extremely you know, communist line, uh, revolt and blood, you know, you can say the uh, you know, blood set mechanism. But in Indian approach, uh, both versions were there, uh, the extremist and the moderate, and both are simultaneously going on this, uh, both sides. And, uh, and important, uh, let me put some important uh, uh, figures of some extremist and the modernist. Uh, just, just yeah. let me interrupt so I can, I, 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 don't, I don't have to translate too much, Professor, sorry. O professor estava explicando que no caso da Índia é, foi diferente de alguns outros casos da África e da Ásia, que, por exemplo, tiveram visões diferentes de nacionalismo. E é, enquanto em outros países da África e da Ásia a gente viu uma visão muito mais extremista, às vezes aproximando de é, noções de comunismo, às vezes aproximando de visões mais terroristas e de derramamento de sangue, na Índia a gente teve as duas versões, a gente teve tanto uma versão mais violenta, mas a gente teve andando junto ao mesmo tempo um lado moderado. O objetivo era o mesmo, né? O objetivo tanto das correntes extremistas quanto das correntes é, das correntes moderadas era atingir a autodeterminação da Índia, né? A independência política. Mas a experiência vivida na Índia foi diferente. Então agora ele gostaria de falar de algumas é, figuras importantes nos dois lados da Índia, né? Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. So, uh, uh, let me quote uh, Arbind Ghosh. Uh, Arbind Ghosh uh, and Shawarkar, uh, they were trying to you know, uh, liberate country uh, through the mythological figure, like for uh, Arbind Ghosh, appeal to Sakti, that means the power, uh, the symbolizes like uh, Durga, Bhavani, Kali, is the Indian mythological goddess, a symbol of power, yes, we can resist, we can take our dependence through the power approach. Uh, we don't need to any kind of prayer, uh, like, 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 like beggars. 
No, okay. They don't leave the country if they try to resort to the kind of soft power. Should they invoke uh, mythological figures, the goddess like Durga, Kali, uh, Bhavani, uh, by the Arbindo Ghosh, and Savarkar, he praised Lord Rama, his mythological figure in Indian philosophy. Uh, she, uh, he said that, yes, Lord Rama... Okay, yeah, professor, professor okay. I, will, I will have to go slow here. I'm so sorry. Uh, o professor estava explicando que é, para o movimento, por exemplo, do Arubino Rose, é, houve um apelo para Shakti, a noção de Shakti é, religiosa na Índia, que era a noção de poder, mas na sua forma criativa, mas também na sua forma violenta, né? E aí de figuras como Durga, Bhavani, Kali, né? Então eram figuras materiais, figuras de destruição e de mudança através da violência, se fosse o caso. Enquanto isso, o Gandhi ele admitiu a força da, da, da alma, né, o soft power, é, é, enquanto os violentos diziam, olha, nós não vamos é, implorar, não seremos mendigos pela independência. É, do outro lado, para Gandhi, Gandhi invocou a, a noção de Rama também, que era a de, é uma noção indiana filosófica de é, autossofrimento e sacrifício. Enquanto Savarkar tinha é, a possibilidade de destruir Ramvan, mas eu deixo o professor explicar melhor agora. Thank you, professor. Ok. So, as I said, that uh, Indian uh, freedom movement uh, it was uh, dominated by the modest extremist. However, uh, the early, uh, you can say the 1920s, uh, under the Gandhi leadership, the character of our uh, Indian independence, uh, Indian freedom movement, it, it, you know, it changed, it dramatically changed under the Gandhian leadership. See, the Gandhian leadership, you know, it invoked the soul force, like Hindu Shiraz, you know, he, you know, he coined the concept of Hindu Shiraz, that yes, we are willing to, uh, we are willing to get independence, not by the force, but by the soul force, not by the arm, you no know, physical power, but by the soul force. So he invoked a different kind of mechanism to fight against the might. He strongly believed that the big time. Eu vou aproveitar que o professor teve um problema de conexão para explicar o que o Gandhi estava falando. O Gandhi, ele a partir de 1920, o movimento de independência sob liderança do Gandhi, ele adquiriu outros contornos. E esses outros contornos, eles não eram tão focados na uh, força bruta, mas no poder da alma, no poder da consciência. E é que aí ele lançou o livro Hindi Shiraz, que não deveria, não era, era um, um, um movimento que dizia nós queremos atingir a independência política, porém nós não queremos isso através da violência, nós queremos usar o nosso poder da alma, o nosso poder é, interno. Um, eu, que, eu acho que o professor desconectou. Já vai reconectar, eu acredito. Hello. Hello, professor. Hello. We are Hello. back. Hello. Hello, professor. Uh, yeah. Can you? We are back. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, as I said that the Gandhian uh, under the Gandhi leadership, uh, uh, no, the the nature of uh, fighting against the Britishers it was decisively changed. And it was the Gandhi who, uh, who changed uh, the character of uh, this fight from class to mass. It was the Gandhi who invoked the common people in the fight against the Britishers. And that is why, that is why uh, under his leadership, uh, you know, uh, around uh, 30 years, uh, around the 20, 25 years, uh, finally we got independent country. So he changed this, uh, the fight from the class because earlier Indian National Congress was you no know, identified the class character. 
but the Gandhi leadership, he touched the marsh, he touched the marsh sentiment, oh, no, he changed himself according to the marsh, and he realized that, yes, I can fight with the might power, a power that's, uh, that, 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 that doesn't sit, uh, the, the sun that doesn't sit in the world, so we can only fight through the marsh, through the marsh power. So this is the unique methodology that was used by the Gandhi. Então, o que o Gandhi fez foi é, transformar uma ideia de uma, uh, uma libertação, uma independência focada na ideia de classe, né? então a luta era de classe, mas aí ele mudou isso para uma, uma questão das massas. Né? Então, ele trouxe o sentimento das massas para o movimento de independência. Ele falou, eu não vou fazer desse momento de independência um momento de classes, mas eu vou enfrentar o um império uh, no qual o sol não se põe, os britânicos, eu vou usar o poder das massas, eu vou integrar as massas no meu processo de independência. Então, foi essa integração que fez com que, é, 25 anos depois do Gandhi ter é, iniciado sua liderança nos, uh, no movimento de independência da Índia, que se atingisse efetivamente a independência da Índia. So, thank you, professor. Ok, let me uh, please move the slide. Yes. Now, the second uh, segment, uh, which I had already mentioned, that uh, economic factor uh, that created a sense of uh, consciousness against the pit search. So, let me uh, proceed this logic. Uh, uh, Indian economic historian Dada Bhai Naraji and Ramesh Datta viewed that the British laws had caused untold suffering to the Indian economy by draining resources to the taxation and to the process of industrialization. It destroyed the livelihood of millions of artisans and turned into powerful people in the hands of Indian nationalists. Uh, my dear uh, friend, uh, Dadabhai Naraji, uh, just me conclude this sentence, Dadabhai Naraji, as a, as a, that, am I clear to you? My voice is clear? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Okay. So, Dada Bhai Narosi, as an economic uh, historian, uh, no, you know, he tried to that in British Empire, the British Empire, the policy of taxation, the policy of, you know, uh, you know uh, cruelty uh, to suppress uh, the Indian uh, textiles industry, uh, Indian uh, no, uh, artisans, it created a discontent among the masses and it provided fertile for the nationalism in India. Um, então, o professor está explicando, é, citando dois historiadores econômicos indianos, o Naurod e o Dutt, que viram que o Raj britânico, né, a liderança britânica, causou um sofrimento incontável à economia, à economia indiana através de sugar os recursos com é, taxação e o processo de desindustrialização. Isso daí destruiu a vida de milhares de artesãos, ele falou, o professor mencionou a questão de é, tecelães, né? os tecelães indianos que perderam o, o, o modo de vida, é, e isso daí se tornou um instrumento muito poderoso nas mãos de nacionalistas indianos, né? As pessoas ficaram com um ressentimento muito grande contra os britânicos porque os britânicos simplesmente impuseram medidas econômicas tão fortes que o sofrimento era muito grande para a população da Índia e isso daí é, fez com que houvesse um nacionalismo econômico indiano. Ou seja, as pessoas buscassem é, a independência porque elas viram o, o, o problema econômico que os britânicos trouxeram para o povo, para as massas indianas, né? Então, é isso que o professor colocou. Thank you, professor. Ok. Uh, let me uh, quote, uh, <coughs> let me quote uh, English uh, historian, uh, English economic historian, Angus Madison. Uh, he said that a country uh, once, uh, the country once, uh, <coughs> once been among the world's richest for 23rd percent of global GDP, had been reduced by 1947, uh, turned into, uh, into one of the poorest, one of the uh, most backward 
and most illiterate and diseased society on the earth. This is somehow English British historian illustrated the why did British come in India? They come in India in a powerful state, a country which which was sharing 23% of global GDP. So this was the important. And by, by 1947, it turned into the as most backward, most in the church, as well as the most diseased society on the earth because of the British policy, British exploitative policy. É, então, ele está citando um historiador britânico que, em 1820, né, ele, o historiador britânico, na verdade, ele notou que, em 1820, uh, o que, que os britânicos fizeram desse ano até a independência da Índia, ele mostrou que é, a Índia, antes da colonização britânica, antes da dominação britânica, ela era um dos países mais ricos do mundo, responsáveis por 23% do PIB global. E isso daí fez, é, é, e até 1947, é, a Índia foi transformada em um dos países mais ricos do mundo, um dos países mais importantes da economia global, é, para um dos países mais pobres, mais retrógrados, com mais analfabetismo e com mais doenças na Terra. Então, para vocês verem o quanto que um historiador britânico conseguiu apontar é, mostrando o desastre que os britânicos fizeram na Índia. Ok, let me, uh, let me let me proceed this law, uh, argument. Uh, from uh, 1900 uh, to 1947, the rate of Indian economic growth was less even than one percent. Can you imagine, Professor Cassio? A country, a country that was country that was sharing that was said 23 percent of global GDP. From 1900 to 1947, the growth rate of the Indian economy was below the 1%. And but the, when the British rule left India, it was the 16% literacy rate, as well as uh, the, uh, it was 16% literacy rate. No domestic industry. Over the 90% people were living under the below poverty line. This is the gift. This is the colonization gift of the British Empire to India. It is response. It is just nurse, just just wait, just uh, uh, few seconds. It is response to those scholars who argue that this colonization process that benefited the Indian economy, benefited the Indian Indian economic system. It has integrated the in, uh, world economic system. This is this this fact. The figures demonstrates that the Indian Indian economy has been ruined under the British Empire. Então, o professor apontou que de 1900 até 1947, o crescimento da economia da Índia foi menos de 1% ao longo desses 47 anos. E aí ele diz que a Índia deixou, os britânicos deixaram a Índia com algo em torno de 16% só de alfabetização, sem industrialização doméstica e com mais de 90% das pessoas na Índia morando, é, vivendo abaixo da linha de pobreza, né? E aí ele diz que isso daí, esses é, esses dados históricos servem para é, contrapor aquela visão que se tem no Reino Unido hoje de que a colonização teria servido para beneficiar a Índia, para trazer a civilização. Como é que pode um país que era tão estruturado antes da a dominação britânica ter sido deixado numa situação como essas por conta dos contornos econômicos que os britânicos impuseram ao país. Thank you, professor. Okay, let me again add some figures and facts. Uh, that, uh, uh, especially the literacy rate, uh, because uh, somehow it is you know, a comment on that uh, uh, British education system has benefited the Indian, uh, Indian social system, Indian education system. So let me uh, put some figures here. Like uh, during, uh, when the British came in India, uh, during the time, 3.2% literacy rate in 1600. When they left India, 16% literacy rate. That means 12% uh, uh, increase. And today, Indian literacy rate is 74%. You can imagine that independent country achieved from 16 to 74 in the 70 years. And the 300 years from 1600 to 1947, it was only 12% increase of literacy rate. So this is the response to those 
to those Anglo-Saxon scholars who appreciated uh, the, 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 you know, the legacy of the you know, colonization, uh, British colonized, the, it has been fit of the Indian education system. This, uh, this figure refutes this claim, Professor Cassio. Então, o professor está dizendo mais um dado que prova é para refutar os pesquisadores anglo-saxões que dizem que a educação da Índia se beneficiou muito como nunca durante o governo britânico. É, ele disse que, olha, durante a época da colonização, a, a taxa de alfabetização na Índia no começo era de 3,2, lá no ano 1600, quando começaram as colonizações na, na, na Índia, era 3,2. E a, até o fim da época colonial, né, da independência, era 16%. Então, a gente teve um aumento de 12%, mais ou menos. Só que, se a gente pensar que, como um país independente, que a gente tem muito menos tempo, é, a, a taxa de alfabetização da Índia foi de 16% para 74%, a taxa atual, a gente vê que, como independentes, a Índia conseguiu muito mais progresso na educação do que... É, os é, britânicos fizeram em séculos de exploração. Uh, thank you, professor. Okay, let me uh, let me uh, put another example. This was the economic uh, facts uh, that you know, that uh, that endorse uh, that refutes the Anglo-Saxon scholars uh, uh, that yes, it was fantasy to call uh, to you know, to uh, to you know, uh, to. Uh, Uh, glorify the in you know, British education system in India. It was the fantasy according to these uh, figures. Uh, so let uh, let me, uh, Professor Cashew, let me uh, put another you know, uh, another picture uh, that was uh, very very unfortunate that took place in 1943 because of British British policy. Uh, this picture uh, you know, demonstrates how the colonizers, how the British authority deliberately, consciously created famine. The 1943 Bengal famine, it was, which caused over 3 million deaths. 3 million people were died during this famine. During, yes, please. O professor está apontando mais uma outra questão, que é um dado muito triste, um dado muito chocante, que é, em 1943, a fome de Bengal, que ele estima que foi causada por, é, por deliberadamente por políticas econômicas é, britânicas, então foi algo proposital feito pelos britânicos, que estima-se que tenha causado mais ou menos 3 milhões de mortes. Né? Thank you. Ok. So, uh, in this famine, it is generally believed and it is, uh, there is research that is demonstrate that uh, 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 Winston Churchill, he was the Prime Minister of the uh, Britain at the time, Winston Churchill deliberately created this famine and uh, because uh, the rice, it was exported to other countries and the people of Bengal, they were demanding for the rice. Let me quote uh, a uh, Britain Bengali actor Somitra Chatterjee at the time he was eight, year, eight years old. So the, the way he narrated, a uh, people would cry pitifully asking for the liquid that came out of cooking rice because they knew nobody had any rice to give them. So he diz que isso daí foi uma política deliberadamente feita pelo então primeiro-ministro britânico Winston Churchill. É, o arroz que era produzido ele era todo exportado para outros países e não ficava lá na Índia. E aí ele está citando um autor, é, um ator bengali é, veterano, o Sumitra Chatterjee, é, não sei se eu pronunciei corretamente, é, ele diz que as pessoas choravam é, em desespero, pedindo pelo líquido que sobrava do arroz cozido, porque eles sabiam que ninguém tinha arroz para dar para eles. Então, as pessoas estavam buscando aquele líquido uh, do cozimento do arroz como uma sobra, né, para que eles pudessem comer aquilo, e eles imploravam pelo acesso a esse líquido como uma forma de nutrição deles. Thank you, professor. Ok. So, uh, this uh, Bengal feminine, it has created... Uh, it, it has created, uh, you know, 
a kind of discontent, a kind of disappear, a kind of dissatisfaction about the this deliberated created a famine. And uh, when Churchill was blamed, so let me remind you, let me quote Churchill's statement, the very, very seamlessly he quoted. You can imagine the kind of colonizing experience. He said, Indians were breeding like rabbits. During this, uh, uh, no, when the three million people were dying, uh, his statement, uh, uh, he made such kind of a statement. So you can realize uh, the kind of <laughs> colonizing experience. Mm, I am shocked, Professor. Uh, well, I remember that next time I see a Churchill statue, I will destroy it. Um, uh, bom, o professor está explicando é, que, para vocês verem, por que, que se diz tanto que a culpa era do Churchill ou que o Churchill estava envolvido nisso daí, é, enquanto estavam morrendo as 3 milhões de pessoas lá em Bengal, o Churchill ele tinha feito uma reunião de gabinete e ele falou, ah, veja, os, as pessoas na Índia estão se reproduzindo como coelhos. Então foi essa a reação do Churchill quando falaram para ele da situação toda da fome. Ele falou, eles estão se reproduzindo como coelhos. Isso daí mostra o tipo de experiência de colonialização que os uh, indianos tiveram que sofrer nas mãos dos britânicos. So, uh, Thank you, professor. Can you, can you move the slide? Okay, this is the picture of Bengal feminine on 1943. Aí é uma foto da, uh, da fome em Bengal em 1943. Yes, please proceed the next, next slide. Okay, now the next uh, topic, uh, the next, sorry, the next point, uh, which is very important uh, for today, the discussion uh, uh, around the colonial development, whether it was a development. Uh, some scholars uh, uh, cherished this uh, colonial legacy, a colonial experience that, yes, uh, uh, colonies are benefited from the colonizers. Uh, so there is debate, and in this debate, Indian contest, I'll you know I'll put the two figures. One is former Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, and another is the UN-based diplomat Sasi Tharoor. Now he's a politician, uh, he's a member of Parliament. So the two streams, Sasi Tharoor will talk uh, in. So yes. let, let me just uh, sorry because we we need to have it in, in Portuguese. Uh, então, o professor Tripathi agora vai falar sobre o outro ponto da fala dele, que é a ideia do mito do desenvolvimento colonial. Ele afirma que existem debates, alguns historiadores dizem que teria ocorrido desenvolvimento é, a, por conta do, da colonização, mas que ele gostaria de apontar dois, é, duas referências aqui nesse aspecto. Em primeiro lugar, o antigo primeiro-ministro da Índia, o Mamorra Singh, e depois o pesquisador Shaksi Taror. Uh, so, thank you, professor. I am sure that I am not properly speaking the names. I, I can speak English, but I do not properly understand the no. pronunciation of no, some words. I'm so sorry. No, no issue, <laughs> professor Cacho. No issue, Okay, no issue. you have the word. Uh, uh, so, uh, let me uh, proceed this argument uh, that... Uh, Professor Sasi Tharoor says that, uh, let me quote Sasi Tharoor, the British came to, uh, to one of the richest countries in the world over 200 years of exploitation, loot, and destruction reduced it to a poster child for third world poverty. This is statement made by the Sasi Tharoor is very, very critical about the British colony, but the British colonial so-called development, so-called you know, uh, beneficiaries, uh, Indian. So he's very critical and, uh, you know, he mentioned the term loot. They looted us properly. They distracted us. They destroyed Indian textile uh, industry system. Um, o professor está citando Sasi Tharoor que ele fala que, olha, os britânicos vieram para um dos países mais ricos do mundo e que em 200 anos de exploração, roubo e destruição reduziram a indústria têxtil da Índia, que era muito poderosa. né O dado que ele coloca ali é que é, em 1600 o Reino Unido era menos de 2% do produto interno, uh, do produto global, né de, dos recursos do PIB mundial. 
mas que em 200 anos eles se tornaram um dos mais poderosos impérios, roubando, explorando os recursos de economias como, por exemplo, da Índia. Né? Reduzindo a Índia a um país, como a, a Tarur coloca, a, tornando a Índia um pôster para a pobreza do terceiro mundo. Thank you, professor. Ok, ok. Now he, uh, no, he added uh, some uh, uh, facts, like uh, when he says that uh, when the Britishers came in India in 1600, uh, Britain accounted for less than 2% of world's GDP. And by the uh, 18th century, Britain had become one of the most powerful empires. This is because of the Indian colony that benefited to the British. Então, ele está destacando aqui que se a gente for olhar o crescimento britânico na época colonial e, e da onde que veio isso daí? Isso daí se beneficiou da exploração econômica que eles fizeram contra os indianos. Ok. So, uh, can I proceed? Yes, Hello. yes. Yes, yes, okay. you can. So this, this is this is the one site. Uh, uh, this is the one, uh, and another site. Uh, former Indian Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh extols the virtue of British uh, colonial uh, experience, like rule of law, constitutionalism, of uh, freedom, uh, no freedom of expression. This kind of the modernity. Uh, he, he, you know, you know uh, glorified the colonies that if India inherited the rule of law, constitution, and uh, you no know, individual liberty, it's just because of the uh, British colonial. E ao mesmo tempo ele fala que por outro lado a gente tem a visão do Mamorra Singh, né, dizendo que olha é, foi por conta dos britânicos que nós temos o rule of law, o governo constitucional e outras contribuições que ele atribuía, ele glorificava os britânicos por conta disso daí. Thank you, professor. Ok, let me proceed the next debate. Uh, I would like to uh, know, imply here A.G. Frank theory of dependency. A.G. Frank, his economic historian, uh, he you know, propounded theory of dependency in the two form. One is metropolis. Metropolis means a uh, colonizer country like European country. And another is a satellite country like Asian, African, Latin American countries. So, uh, yes. <laughs> E para isso ele está citando a teoria da, da dependência do Ed Frank. Ele diz que haveriam as metrópoles, que seriam as nações, e as, saté as nações satélites, aí, América Latina, Ásia e África. E aí que uma explora a outra. So, according to Ed Frank, he says that, yes, the development of satellite, satellite is the underdevelopment of metropolis. In another way, the development of the metropolitan state is the underdevelopment of the satellite. That means there is a binary, there is an antagonism, there is a there is a no, there, there is a geosome situation in, in international relations. The the loss of one is the gain of other. The gain of uh, one is the loss of other. So this is situation of the uh, colonizers and the colonized countries. Então, ele diz que, na verdade, isso daí é uma questão antagonista, uma questão binária. Ele explica que quando um país satélite se enriquece, isso daí tira né, a possibilidade de enriquecimento da metrópole. E o contrário também é verdade. A metrópole vai se enriquecer às custas da, uh, do satélite, né, por conta de dominação. Thank you, professor. Oh, let, uh, please proceed the slide. Okay, let me uh, conclude in short because uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, less time and I, I want to focus on Brazil and Indian colonization experience. So let me uh, uh, concise this Indian textile and uh, education system. Uh, so uh, as we know that uh, uh, Indian textile India was known as for its cotton industry, India was known for the exporter of the spice and, and the textile, and, but it was brutally destroyed by the colonial powers like British colonial force and, uh, <coughs> and uh, the equally, yes please. Ele está explicando agora na parte de comparação do processo de descolonização do Brasil e da Índia, ele vai falar da Índia aqui, a parte da educação e a parte da indústria, especialmente a indústria têxtil, 
que ela foi brutalmente destruída pelo domínio britânico. Thank you, professor. Ok, please proceed uh, the uh, next uh, slide. Ok, this is British divisive education policy. And the debate revolves with the debate uh, revolves around the colonial legacy, whether it, it, it has benefited the colony or not. So in this, this uh, education policy becomes important. It is a very important apparatus uh, to determine whether it has uh, you know, undermined or it has benefited to the colony. Aqui ele vai falar agora sobre a, a política educacional extremamente divisiva que os britânicos colocaram como maneira de dominação da colônia. Né? A educação foi usada como um instrumento de dominação, ele está explicando. Ok. Let me uh, quote some important uh, British figures. Uh, Warren Hastings, he came in India. He was the first governor general of Bengal. And he invoked, he implied, he used a soft power like, like building institutions, uh, educational institutions, uh, and to know the Indic language. Orient he was orientalist. Like he was interested to the Indian culture, Indian language, Indian custom. So he wanted to establish the soft power to hegemonize the Indian Indians uh, social cultural system and to understand the nuance of Indian cultural system. Então ele mostrou que no primeiro momento a gente tinha momentos é, de estudos globais é, em Bengal que focavam no Oriente na cultura e, e tentando mostrar que havia uh, haviam línguas uh, locais. Havia costumes locais e tradições locais. Ok. So, if the institutions were developed, educational institutions were developed, for what? Let me quote. British rule, uh, education played an integral role in consolidating the British rule for the colonial project. If they were trying to build the educational institution, not for the civilizing mission of the country, but because to consolidate their position in the colony. E que aí o que que foi feito? Foram feitas é, propostas educacionais pelos britânicos que na verdade não tinham nada a ver com o processo de civilização, mas que eram é, buscavam na verdade é, ser uma maneira de dominar e de controlar a colônia. Ok. So this is the this is the uh, first uh, scenario, the the first soft power mechanism that was evolved by the Warren Hastings. Another scenario is uh, which we know uh, Indians generally uh, you know hit uh, to Macaulay that imposed English language in our country. So Macaulay is known the hard power approach for English uh, for educational institutions. Então, ele está dizendo que primeiro foi houve essa abordagem soft power, fazendo uma educação um pouquinho mais uh, sutil, mas que depois teve é, pessoas como Macaulay, que foi quem propôs, forçou a língua britânica, a língua inglesa, como obrigatória no, na Índia. Né? Foi ele que propôs aí uma medida um pouquinho mais dura, um pouquinho mais é, uh, imposta. Okay, uh, let me quote uh, Michael's statement uh, that will demonstrate his uh, uh, mental setup about the Indian colony. Uh, you know, he said that uh, he wanted uh, he wanted to create a class of Indians who were Indian in color and blood, but English in taste and affiliation. This is kind of colonization. This is kind of colonization that will help to consolidate the Indian, sorry, British uh, Uh, authority in Indian colony. E que uma frase que é atribuída a Macaulay era que ele queria, através dessa política educacional dele, é, criar uma classe de indianos, uma categoria de indianos que fosse indiano na cor da pele e no sangue, mas que no fundo, no fundo, no fundo, tivesse uma, um pensamento, uma maneira britânica, e isso daí foi usado como um mecanismo de é, controle da colônia. Ok, please uh, proceed uh, uh, next slide. Yes, this is important. Uh, I think 
this is comparative analysis of decolonization process in Brazil and India. And uh, I'll try to focus how the both country uh, now experience from the colonization process and uh, the way uh, Brazil uh, uh, you know, registered against the colonizers and the way India uh, you know, registered revolt against the colonizers. So I'll try to make compare here. Então, o professor está dizendo agora que ele acredita que seja proveitoso fazer uma comparação, estudar como foram os processos de descolonização é, brasileiro e indiano. Então, é isso que ele vai fazer agora. Ok. So, Portuguese arrive in both India and Brazil. At the same time, an early 16th century, 1500, Pedro Alvarez uh, Cabrillo, Uh, he, who discovered the Brazil, I got it, uh, from uh, Portugal to uh, went to Brazil and discovered Brazil. Uh, he was a Portuguese nobleman, explorer and navigator. And uh, he also established a successful sea route to the India uh, uh, for the trade. E aí ele está falando aqui do Brasil, que o Brasil foi descoberto por é, Pedro Álvares Cabral, um nobre português, explorador e navegador, e que ele também estabeleceu uma rota comercial muito importante para a Índia para comércio. Sim, sim. Brasil e Índia... Uh, that means uh, defense in terms of that uh, when the Portuguese came in uh, Brazil, so there was no settled uh, no, uh, population and there was there was there were tribes and uh, uh, no concrete uh, nation, the feeling of nation state. And uh, that's why it was very easy for Portuguese to, you uh, know, Uh, to maintain uh, its colony in the uh, in the Brazil, because Brazil is no uh, was known for its sugar, uh, uh, for its you uh, know uh, no, Amazon forest. So as I when I, I, I listed that uh, uh, the colonizers were looking such a raw material, such a uh, such a market, and Brazil was you know fit for that. E ele está falando que quando os portugueses chegaram aqui no Brasil, uma coisa que foi bem feita foi ignorar a própria existência de uma, uma um conceito de uma nação aqui no Brasil. né? Ele diz que quando os portugueses chegaram aqui não havia um sentimento nacional é, brasileiro, um sentimento próprio, e aí os, os portugueses chegaram aqui viram que a gente tinha cana-de-açúcar, a gente tinha muitos recursos, e eles encararam como sendo livre para simplesmente poder tomar, porque eles não consideraram que havia uma nação, não havia um sentimento de nação aqui no Brasil na época. Ok. So, uh, Professor Cassio, as I said, that uh, uh, the common, uh, the first uh, Brazil and the same experience in India. And they were, you know, looking for a uh, market. Uh, because uh, I already said that uh, uh, in the Europe, uh, there was competition and the industrialization process started there. So the competition between the European forces, European powers. So, but it was very fortunate. Brazil was fortunate that only Portugal is. There was a treaty between Portugal and Spain uh, in the South America, in the sorry, in the Latin America. That yes, uh, this part will be enjoyed by the Spain and this part by the Portuguese. And of course, Brazil uh, uh, under the uh, under the part of uh, no, uh, <coughs> uh, Portuguese authority. E o professor Sandip aponta que o Brasil foi, de certo modo, teve um pouquinho de sorte, de certo modo, de ter sido colonizado apenas por um país e que não havia uma disputa entre diferentes países, como na Europa havia uma competição grande. E aí aqui o que, que tinha? A gente tinha um tratado entre Portugal e Espanha e que dizia que Brasil, ali a região do Brasil, ia ser é, dominada pelos portugueses. Thank you. Ok. Uh, Bra Brazil had remained a single colony under Portuguese rule, while in India several European powers established state colonies such as Dutch, French and English. E ele está dizendo que enquanto o Brasil ele foi colônia é simplesmente de Portugal, 
ele está dizendo que a Índia foi de, é, passou uma época por domínio é, holandês também, francês e britânico. And see, there is, uh, there is a difference in Brazil and India in terms of the colonization process. Uh, the difference is that when the uh, Britishers came in India, so the Indian social structure was very complex. There is the class stratification, caste stratification, class stratification. So uh, Indian society was so plural, uh, heterogeneous society. That was very difficult. Uh, religiously, Indian society, there was some bitterness. Uh, so when Britishers came, they tried to rule and divide in India. They tried to spread the hatred between the two communities, Hindu and Muslims. Uh, it was not the in Brazil. This was not the case in the Brazil. Which are Brazil's social structure, not like this Indian social structure. That was very easy for Portuguese to maintain properly the Portuguese society. <coughs> e que uma dificuldade, uma diferença essencial que tem entre o processo de colonização é, de, do Brasil e da Índia é que enquanto aqui no Brasil é, os portugueses tiveram uma certa facilidade para dominar culturalmente, né, porque eles simplesmente ignoraram o que havia aqui, no caso da Índia, os britânicos tiveram uma ideia um pouco diferente, porque na Índia havia uma sociedade já bem estratificada, com complexidade religiosa e, e diferentes grupos. Então, os britânicos eles passaram a explorar e a incentivar é, a rivalidade entre os diferentes estratos da sociedade indiana. Então, isso daí foi uma característica que foi diferente da colonização brasileira para a colonização é, que ocorreu na Índia. So uh, this is all about uh, my lecture, uh, today's lecture uh, about the uh, colonization process in India, sorry, decolonization process in India. And uh, uh, I, Professor Cascio, I think the time is very less, so we should give some time for the questions, uh, question or session. Uh, <coughs> because uh, I think I had covered uh, lots of uh, points uh, So, uh, uh, I, I welcome uh, some questions to respond from your uh, students and from the faculty members and the members of the uh, your BRICS. And uh, also, uh, I request some questions. I welcome some questions from Indian side also. So now, from my side, uh, the floor is open for the question. Okay, thank you very much, Professor uh, Tripathi. This was a wonderful lecture. It was very much uh, rich to see how we, we had, even though we had different experiences in some, in some points, as Professor has very well pointed out. In Brazil, we, we, had, a, we had the Catholic religion imposed, and that was it. While in India there was uh, Christianity, but it was at the same time uh, uh, the division that was uh, maybe heightened by uh, British policy because the British wanted to divide to conquer in India. And uh, it was very, very rich discussion. I will present some questions from the students. Our student, Alan, he has asked, I will translate from Portuguese to English, uh, how did the uh, connection between India and other nations before the independence work? How was the economic connections set up? And how did Europe influence local uh, politics in India during before independence movement? And uh, so... I don't know if professor would like me to do all the questions now and then uh, the professor would answer or if we would do each question separately. I think how, how it would be better for you, professor. Now see, I welcome all the questions. I, I'll try to respond to all the questions because the question, we are Indians are very in love for the questions, our session. So <laughs> I, I would like to, concern, but uh, please, uh, I, I request you to brief the question. If the question will be brief, it would be very, uh, uh, you know, I, I will be comforted to respond the brief question. So can okay. you repeat again? Can you repeat so, again? <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, how did Europe influence local Indian policy before the independence uh, was achieved? Sorry, uh, how, how was how was 
how did Europe influence, how did European uh, nations, how did the British influence India uh, politics, local politics before independence? How was uh, okay. the po how are the politics before independence? Okay, 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 okay. See, uh, uh, as we see that uh, uh, this question is a very important question, and uh, uh, the European uh, began to influence uh, Indian politics uh, onwards the uh, no onwards the sixteen hundred. Uh, like uh, first of all, the policy of divide and rule. First of all, they appeased to Muslims. Then they tried to appease the uh, Hindus. And okay, because uh, they, they they wanted some kind of loyalty on the base of uh, on the base of ethnicity, on the base of caste, on the base of you uh, know class, on the base of religion. So they they knew very well that India is stratified. India is so classified. So. Uh, they were convinced that it is very easy to manipulate India on the basis of identity. So that was that was the policy of European countries, especially the British, to divide and rule. Então que uh, o professor Sandeep está explicando, Alan, que é, o que os britânicos fizeram foi se aproveitar especialmente da uh, da sociedade estratificada que havia na Índia, né? Então, especialmente aí, primeiro eles tentaram agradar aos muçulmanos, depois eles tentaram se aproximar dos uh, dos hinduístas, e a ideia era se aproveitar de divisão de casta, incentivar para dividir a sociedade indiana de uma maneira que eles pudessem conquistar. Então, a política era através da aproximação com diferentes grupos para tentar fazer com que um brigasse contra o outro, e aí os britânicos surgissem como a fonte comum, digamos. Uh, so I translated, professor, I will go to the next question. Um, professor uh, from our faculty, professor Cristina Borges, uh, she said that here in Brazil, we, today we don't have, we, we have rice, a lot of rice, but the prices are so high because we have a very strong export culture. So we, even though we, we produce a lot of rice, we export it. And uh, the result, is, this is a reflex from our colonial period until today, and that the result is also famine. So we also have famine here in Brazil, even though we produce a lot of rice, we, because we export and the price is very high. I think the uh, professor just made a small comment and not a, a question. And another student of us, uh, prof, uh, student João Humberto, he asked us, uh, professor, uh, how and how much Tolstoy and... Professor, can, you, uh, can, can I respond one by one, one by one question? Yes, yes. Um, so, so if you'd like to, co to comment uh, what Professor... Yes, I, I'll welcome. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll make comment. Can you, can you again brief the uh, no, uh, comment? Yes, uh, can you professor, professor Cristina, she said that here in Brazil we are a very big rice producer. We produce a lot of rice in Brazil. But we, uh, the prices are very high because since we were a colony we have developed an uh, export culture. So even though we produce a lot of rice here, the price is very high because we export all the rice to abroad. Okay. So okay. this okay. was Thank her you. consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. See, uh, it's a very uh, irony, it's a very unfortunate uh, that uh, uh, Brazil is known for its rice as well as the sugar. And uh, just like in India, uh, in India, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, India agriculture oriented country, agriculture, agriculture driven country. Yes, uh, people are dying. Uh, yes, this is this is unpass. This is paradox. Is sometimes uh, you are you no, know, you are the biggest producer of some crop, like uh, like in Brazil, you mentioned the rice, but the, due to the exporting you know, culture. Uh, government try to you know export. Government doesn't pay uh, a, a proper pay uh, for those who are the uh, producer of the uh, crop. 
so this is somewhat i feel i strongly feel that this is colonial legacy sometimes when we criticize the government just because of the mind setup just because the mind setup do we are is still a free country but the who are let me let me let me uh, let me uh, quote a very important line in this comment uh uh if the politics decides the destiny of the nation who will decide the destiny of the politics so <laughs> so this is what <laughs> so this is what let me this is what uh, uh, this is what my kale uh, quote that uh, uh, color and uh, uh, skin they are indians but mind and taste they are still colonized this is because of the things that are happening ele aponta o professor Sandeep que é extremamente irônico, não deixa de ser irônico que muitos países, tanto o Brasil quanto a Índia, sejam grandes produtores agrícolas, mas que por conta dessa mentalidade colonial a gente acaba exportando isso. E ele mostra que, olha, que ele falou do caso do arroz no Brasil, da, da cana de açúcar do Brasil, e ele fala que, olha, é, isso daí é uma questão dos governos, né? Enquanto o governo não, não fornece condições, não ajuda não incentiva, não dá a menor condição para você ter é, uma economia local, a venda local aqui, isso daí não vai, é, não, não seria resolvido. E aí ele cita o que um colega dele falou, que é, se os políticos decidem os rumos da nação, quem é que vai decidir o rumo dos políticos, né? É, foi a frase que ele falou. E ele lembrou da, daquela ideia indiana, né, da, da mentalidade que foi imposta na Índia durante a colônia, que era justamente pensar de modo colônia, pensar como uma colônia e pensar, então, para exportar. né? Ele falou, na Índia as pessoas têm a cor de pele indiana, têm o sangue indiano, porém elas foram condicionadas ao longo do colonialismo para pensarem ou para admirarem o britânico. Né? O importante, de repente, é o exportar para lá. Uh, so, Professor, I will... Uh, should I go to the next question? Okay? Yes. Yes, welcome. Uh, our colleague from... Uh, our student, uh, he uh, congratulates you, Professor, for the excellent lecture. He is very glad. And he asks how and if, how much... Tolstoy and Kropotkin have influenced the ideas of Gandhi, if there was an influence of Tolstoy and Kropotkin in Gandhi's thought. Uh, one minute. Uh, is it English? Um, it's, no, it's in Portuguese. He asked uh, how and how much Tolstoy and Kropotkin okay. have influenced Gandhi's ideas, if there was this influence. Okay, okay. Tolstoy and Kropotkin. Okay. See, uh, Tolstoy, as we know that uh, uh, the Gandhi, uh, he was uh, such a kind of a statesman, a philosopher, that he strongly believes uh, a self-rule, he strongly believes the, the, the power of self, the power of soul, the power of individuality. He was a mixture. He was a personality that sometimes is a philosophical anarchist like Kropotkin. Uh, Tolstoy, he was, uh, no, uh, he was uh, no, influenced by the Tolstoy, like the peace, the non-violence. And he strongly believes that the nations cannot be built on the basis of uh, a temporal power. The nations can be, built, you know, can be built on the basis of a humanitarian approach, uh, on the basis of uh, a community. And that is the he you know, approached, he educated community-based state. Community, not the political, not the no, uh, no, uh, liberal state which was uh, uh, no, uh, no, promoted by the European countries. He was a strong advocate of the uh, what uh, community, communitarian state. So this was the influence on the Gandhi that he was a believer of the non-violence, and he finally he you know he he you know he has second the, in the empire through his strong conviction of the soul, through his strong conviction of the non-violence that yes empire may be declined through the soul force. Então o professor acredita que haja uma aproximação entre as ideias do Tolstói e do Gandhi. 
porque o Gandhi ele era um, um grande, ele acreditava muito não na, na força individual é, física, mas no poder da alma, no poder do espírito e na ideia de uma aproximação pacífica para a, a paz e para as nações. Ele diz que o país não se tornaria independente, não, não teria como o país ser independente através de um método violento. Ele, ele diz que deveria ser uma conquista comunitária, deveria ser uma busca comunitária. E nisso daí, nesse pacifismo que ele propõe, ele se aproxima Tolstói e Gandhi. Né? Um, I believe I have translated... Uh... Emílio, Emílio, você tem uma é pergunta tua ali? Desculpa. Oi, bom dia, sim. É pergunta, sim. É pode que eu fazer, acho que eu, pode fazer a pergunta em inglês até, Emílio, se quiser. Hello, Emílio. Ok. Hello, professor. Hello. Thank you for, for presenting. I found it perfect. And it's a pleasure for me to be listening to you one more time. I was studying about the about industrial policies uh, in India, and I, I've uh, read the resolution uh, dated of 1956. Uh, It was uh, aiming to nationalize uh, foreign companies as a conception of um, Uh, concre uh, concreting uh, or concluding the process of independence. So my question, and five years planned after independence. So uh, my question was, what was the role, and if it was successful, of this nationalization of foreign companies after political independence uh, to, our, to our concept of decolonization? Uh, uh, Professor Emilio, can you uh, again repeat your question? I mean, I'm questioning what is the importance of nationalization of foreign companies after independence to the process of decolonization, because after independence, India has started to nationalize foreign companies as a, as a way to conclude the process of independence. So I, I am questioning if this is important for decolonization for our conception of decolonization, and what was the function of this activity in the economic field? Uh, see, uh, you know that uh, the first point that after independence, India adopted uh, uh, the five-year plan, okay? And the five-year plan, it was aimed, uh, and it was inspired by the socialist philosophy. Uh, the, so, Uh, I don't think so that after the independence, uh, the nationalization of the foreign companies, it is somehow related to the colonization or decolonization. After the independence, uh, India was you know, looking for, you know, uh, for you know, uh, national so economic uh, uh, reconstruction, economic development. So from both sides, from, uh, from socialist power, from the capitalistic power, India was trying to, diff to diffuse You know, we're trying to you know, uh, you know, evolve such kind of mechanism that can boost Indian national building, especially the economic structure. Because you know, during when the Britishers left India, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the industrialization, it was a very very pathetic situation. So, uh, in that sense, uh, sometimes nationalization, sometimes, you know, so capitalism, socialism was both and both, you know, side by side, it was erupted by the Indian leadership. And it was requirement at the time. <laughs> Thank you. Então, professor uh, Sandip, estou traduzindo. A pergunta do Emílio foi no sentido de qual o papel, basicamente, eu estou falando em português, o Emílio está aí me corrige qualquer coisa, né? <risos> a gente tem amizade para isso. É, o Emílio fez a pergunta mais ou menos porque quando ainda se tornou independente, eles adotaram o um plano de cinco anos, o plano anual, e isso daí envolveu a nacionalização de indústrias estrangeiras. E aí, qual o papel disso daí na, é, no processo de decolonização e independência da Índia? O professor Sandip acredita que não tenha sido tanto uma questão de, é, de é, decolonização, mas tenha sido muito mais uma 
questão de criação de estruturas econômicas na Índia e que nesse primeiro período a gente tinha tanto políticas capitalistas quanto políticas mais de inspiração socialista na Índia. É, pra, a, que a ideia aqui central era justamente você tornar o país, é, ter estruturas econômicas no país. Eu acho que foi mais ou menos isso que foi discutido aí, Emílio, espero que tenha sido correta a minha interpretação das suas perguntas. Foi, foi exatamente isso que eu perguntei, sim, o Cássio é era a inspiração dita socialista, né, depois, e pra, que para alguns uh, seria um projeto de conclusão da independência de descolonização, você nacionalizar e reduzir a independência econômica. E para o professor foi mais uma questão de momento mesmo, de reconstrução, redefinição econômica. Uhum. Mas obrigado pela, pela, pela função de tradução aí. Abração. So, uh, what, what Emilio was saying, professor, was that... Uh, Basically, there was this discussion if this was a part of the independence process or if it was a moment process. So uh, he thanks you for the, the, the information. Um, Professor Cristina Borges, she, uh, she commented, she thanked your uh, position. And he, she has a last question. Um, how is the interpretation of society of the Indian people, how, how the Indian people today see uh, and interpret the colonial period? How, how do you in India, how do, do people in India see today the historical period um, of uh, colonization? Because in Brazil, uh, most people, when we talk about Brazilian colonization, we uh, tend to romanticize this. We tend to um, say, oh, this was a discovery. <laughs> we, we discovered Brazil was discovered. This, this is a myth, like the, 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 the legend. Uh, I will expand a little bit in, in uh, Professor Cristina's uh, consideration. In uh, regular schools in Brazil, we used to teach children that it was a mistake made by the Portuguese, they were following the route, and by mistake, instead of going in the direction of Africa and then India, that was the plan, they, by mistake, they went to the other side and, <laughs> oh, there is something here we did not know, so they discovered it. This, by this mistake, they discovered you say. Yes, By they, mistake, they discovered yes. everything was a mistake. And, and it's, it's so crazy, professor, because uh, the word that the Portuguese use, the legend says that we use the word indios for, to refer to the native Brazilians who were here. We use the word indios because they say the Portuguese arrived here, they thought they were in India, and then they said, oh, India, India. And then the people said, India. And then this is why uh, the people in, here in Brazil, they started to be called Indian. But be because the Portuguese thought they were <laughs> arriving in... Uh, uh, but it's, it's very romanticized and people tend not to look at the, 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 the horrible side. Uh, that uh, professor uh, Caixo, uh, Professor so, Caixo. So the, the, the question is... How do people in India feel today about their colonial process they suffered? I uh, see. Uh, Professor Kais has a very, very interesting question. I think this is the uh, uh, gist part. This is the spirit of this uh, entire whole lecture. Uh, as far as uh, uh, Indian, concern, Indian people are concerned about the colonial legacy or history, so people are very, very different. Uh, people, I think, it's a very diversity of opinion. Uh, about uh, some section, there are some orientalist, orientalist that they, they know, uh, like uh, like Indian scholar like Sasi Tharoor, he says the Britishers Bit destroyed the essence of Indianhood, and others uh, westernized mindset of uh, those who are educated, those who are colonized, uh, properly colonized under British rule, I don't know, they're mesmerized like the rule of law, the constitution, and they mesmerize that Indian uh, British education system, modernization and all that. So it's a kind of romanticism is also here. But uh, uh, 
but uh, 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 individual uh, people like me i'm very very critical on both side see i believe i strongly believe that it was accidental uh, something uh, feminine like i discussed my lecture 1943 feminine in bengal uh, how can one justify the churchill's statement uh, so basically see uh, important point if once is coming for the economic benefit right so economic benefit it cannot create a sense of civilization uh, yes indirectly it establishes for example in railway in, in, in railway construction in india uh, there is a romanticism that british came and uh, they established the railway and modernization so my dear friend this is my response it was the mechanism to loot the india it was mechanism to transport raw materials from the um, uh, british you know, industrial process what is romanticism on this what is what is legacy yes as i said that this is the mind setup game this is a game of mind setup this is a game on psychology and this this is a game is complex the complex the my culture is supreme mcdonald is supreme the indigenous indian culture to so who will break this chain who will break this stereotype yes people like us people like us who will think critically então, o professor Sandip agradeceu a pergunta, ele considera que essa daí é a essência da nossa discussão hoje. Ele diz que existem basicamente duas correntes na Índia, uma corrente que romanticiza, né, que tenta falar, ah, os britânicos trouxeram o rule of law, a constitucionalidade, falam muito também do, uh, da construção de vias férreas na Índia, né, e existe um outro lado, que é o lado mais crítico, que diz como é que você vai justificar o que os britânicos fizeram aqui e aí, o professor Sandip se alinha nessa daí, é, nessa corrente mais crítica, que diz, espera aí, e a fome de Bengal? Como é, que, como é que você justifica a fome, né? E, ah, as linhas férreas, ele está apontando que as linhas férreas, na verdade, eram um meio que eles construíram, os britânicos construíram para roubar os recursos dos, uh, da Índia através de via férrea. E ele diz que não tem como você ter uma perspectiva de desenvolvimento quando os britânicos chegaram lá para simplesmente fazer exploração econômica. Que você não tem como dizer que houve um processo civilizacional, houve um progresso, não é justo você fazer a romantização de um processo que, na verdade, foi feito para a exploração econômica dos britânicos. Um, so, professor, I don't know if we have further questions. Really thank you for your uh, time, for your uh, considerations here. It was uh, wonderful, wonderful. It was not just incredible to see uh, people from uh, my university, but also from uh, colleagues, professors here, and uh, prof uh, professors and researchers from Gebrix uh, who are still there. Uh, Emilio is still <laughs> watching us, Nantala is still there, and uh, Nadia is also still online. So it's very nice to see that people from FAPI, from, FAPI, from, uh, from BRICS, and from, uh, from India are still online watching us. I, it's, it's really, uh, uh, really uh, happy, and it's... Uh, Professor Emilio is saying thank you. It was perfect and a pleasure. Uh, our student Samia is saying very good uh, lecture. I thank for sharing your knowledge with us today, and it's it's a very it was a very happy moment for me to see a very good friend, uh, you, Professor Sandip. It was uh, the second time we do a lecture. The first time, <laughs> the five of us went. Uh, up in the morning, early in the morning, to see you in India, and now this time uh, it was incredible to see you here talking with us. And I hope to continue our cooperation in the future. It was uh, just incredible. And on behalf of the Faculdade de Pinhais, I would like to thank you. Uh, eu agradeço em homenagem da uh, nome da Faculdade de Pinhais pela presença do professor. Eu agradeço a presença de pesquisadores e professores do GEBRICS, 
agradeço a presença de pesquisadores e alunos da FAP e agradeço também a presença de alunos da Índia que estão participando deste evento aqui conosco. É uma alegria, um prazer imenso estar repetindo mais uma vez a situação de cooperação que a gente fez cedo de madrugada participando do evento lá na Índia. E eu espero que novos eventos aconteçam no futuro. E eu dou a palavra agora ao professor Sandeep. Professor Sandeep, I would like to give you again the floor if you would like to get, give any for their consideration, and I thank you very much for the lecture and for your time today, this morning. Thank you very much, uh, uh, thank Tanya Vaughn. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Professor Kaishio. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, giving time for the translation in Portuguese. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm very, very honored and delighted uh, today uh, that uh, I got this opportunity to share my uh, views on this topic with you all colleagues. And uh, literally uh, what, uh, what I am feeling that you all are very, very warm and kind uh, human beings. And this is, uh, uh, though we are virtually interacted to each other, but uh, as, as you know, the Indians are very emotional. So I am very, very overwhelmed. Uh, I am very, very excited, thrilled. Uh, uh, to presence of your colleagues in uh, this program. And uh, at the same time, uh, I hope that in the future, uh, we, will, uh, uh, we will interact with each other on academic discourse. And I hope in the future, we will dismantle this, uh, this colonization uh, you know, mindset of uh, the hegemonic agenda, uh, Gramsci hegemonic agenda, the, uh, the European Eurocentric hegemonic agenda, uh, Anglo Saxon hegemonic agenda. We are the rising power. We should, we should feel this, we should think this, we are the rising stars. Uh, this century will be the century of the Brazil and the India. So uh, I, I think this is not the, though we are discussing, we are discussing about the 18th, 19th century, the 20th century, the powerful countries, but it's still 21st century. We are the power. We have emerged at all. So uh, this century, the century, the century is the Brazil and the century will be the Indian. And I hope that research and the research as well as the knowledge, uh, what kind of knowledge and what kind of research we will produce. It will be the helpful for our country, uh, for India, for Brazil, for forge a deep and deep cooperation and uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, create a, such a, a fraternal uh, bond between the two countries. And uh, I, as I always believe that uh, this southern hemisphere has been colonized, has been uh, you know, experience of the bitter experience. So, uh, no, you know, the kind of we feeling comes to the shared experience. We have the same shared experience of the colonization process. Uh, the same Portuguese, the same British. So it's a kind of a shared history, the kind of shared bonding. The Bible cherish it, Bible enjoy it, and Bible consolidate it, Bible strengthen our nation uh, to each other uh, and people subhumanity. Thank you so much, Professor Kaishio. Thank you so much, Professor Emilio and other uh, faculty members uh, from your uh, uh, institute, uh, from BRICS members. Uh, and I look forward in the future, same kind of lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Pessoal, ele ele está dizendo que ele, como um indiano, ele é bem emotivo e ele está é, é, overwhelmed, é, 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 extasiado por essa experiência. Ele acredita que a gente tenha que forjar cada vez mais vínculos de cooperação e amizade, porque somos países que passaram por é, processos pelo horror da, da colonização, né? nós, países do Sul. E ele acredita que se hoje a gente falou do passado, né, que a gente tenha que pensar que, olha, esse século que está surgindo agora é o século do Brasil, é o século da Índia, e que nós somos as estrelas em crescimento. E que isso daí significa cooperação é, científica, cooperação acadêmica em diferentes áreas para o desenvolvimento dos nossos países, para que nós possamos servir aos nossos países e para que nós possamos servir à humanidade. Um, so, Professor, I have just translated what you said. I thank you very much 
É, eu agradeço a todo mundo, toda a presença. Não é por nada a gente está conseguindo quase hora do almoço aqui no Brasil. It's almost lunch time, so um, it's incredible to see that people are still following us. And I thank you, everyone. Muito obrigado a todo mundo. E eu dou a sessão por encerrada. So I now will close the session. I thank you very much, everyone. Thank And I will make it available, the recording of this meeting later, Professor Tripathi. And I, I see you again in the near future. Muito obrigado, you, pessoal. Um ótimo dia para todo mundo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my camera is there. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, they are bye. they are all saying very uh, that it was an incredible opportunity. So thank you, um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I will give you, professors, really soon the the recording. <laughs>